the magma from erupting volcanoes become the primary rocks and minerals of the Earth's crust. And these are the clay and glaze materials that the potter uses for their art. From the beginning of time, cosmic evolution has created form. It's change and diversity rolled into one. All creation is an ongoing metamorphosis happening all around us and within us. It is the art through which life itself develops and expresses itself from wherever life is. I'm depicting the mountains as female to depict the earth as alive and taking care of us. So what I like to call my womanscape basins are not meant to be nude females on a bowl. They're, they're actually going to turn into living mountains. And you know, when I'm doing this, it's not lost on me that that's exactly what the earth actually does when glaciers move. They carve their paths through valleys creating the valleys that we hike and walk into. Potters all over the world dig their clay from the living earth. And approximately 80% of the earth contains clay. We usually look for it where streams or rivers once flowed. It's made from mountain minerals, combined with plant life and animals from long ago, all the ingredients of soil. Because they're the smallest particles of soil, clay particles stay suspended in water, allowing them to be carried down the mountain to settle slowly in calm water. This is a riverbed, the Kootenai River, and we found some clay deposits underneath. The top layer is silt. It's a bit heavier than the clay particles itself. The actual clay is going to be underneath it. Then in this case, the clay is green. This is the ground, silt, and then the clay. This is how our ancestors made pots millennia ago. And here we have it. The clay story continues from here to the studio. Throw a four pound bowl. Looks like it's almost four pounds. There we go. Clay is crystalline. So we wedge it basically to get some of those air pockets out. And I'm putting a lot of pressure on and pushing it, it creates these layers that are folding in on itself and it's helping the crystalline structure glue together and it also helps get rid of the air pockets and it creates the form that I really want it to end up being for the wheel, the shape of a human heart. I like that image because when we put our heart into our work it's a different kind of intelligence. The centering process really works with a play of opposites. And so I'm taking this whirling ball of uncentered clay of earth, really, and I'm raising it up into the vertical and bringing it back down into the horizontal in order to find the still point in the middle. I'm using my all my strength to bring in the tension, but before I let go, I have to soften that tension. So it's an amazing experience, I think, of finding one's own center while they're centering a pot. Going to trim the bowl 
and I always think of the trimming process as like a glacial process that a potter undergoes. You know, the glacier is carving out the metamorphic rock on the earth, so the glacier is moving. Um, so what's happening here is that the wheel is moving and the potter basically carves it off so that we create the uh, standing pedestal bottom or a foot. Voila! I'm putting a little grog down because I've got my big sink and it's going to move and I don't want it to crack in the firing. So I'm putting some powdered grog in the bottom of the kiln so it can sit on that and if it's going to move, it's going to have something to move on so it won't crack. The grog is ground up bisque fired grog. So it continually gets recycled into something else that serves its use. I always liken the bisque firing to uh, the earth making slate, which is seafloor mud basically that's been compacted and pressurized and the air has been taken out of it together with feldspars and other minerals. It's made a stone but this stone is still crackable, you see? So I could break it. You can break a bisque firing so that part of that is clay and part of that are other mi minerals, but it's still uh, not completely stone, not completely vitrified. Unlike the hundreds of thousands of years that the slate takes to create itself from the earth, it takes my kiln about 12 hours. When COVID-2020 happened, I went into the studio and I got busy, but I wanted to find an artistic response to the fear and social isolation that was happening worldwide to everyone. And so I came up with a new line where literally was a lifeline that for me is a meeting where light and warmth meet in people and how we can meet that in the light of thought when we're not around other people and how we can meet that with all that nourishes us. This is a production line, so I want not only the food to nourish the body, but I want my work to nourish the soul. And so the lifeline is all about where life and soul and body meet. I decided after about six months of working this line, that I would create more warmth from the interior called liner glazes. So I took a candle and I lit it inside one of my bowls and I wanted to find the warmth of where the candle light created the connection between the white gloss and the interior glaze after. So from there on, I made about 15 experiments. I'm wanting to turn a traditional green glaze into a golden honey, warm, orangey glaze that pools at the bottom. It's also gonna be what we call a liner glaze for the inside of my work. This is just a series of different ingredients that I have as though you were gonna build, make a cake, I'm making a glaze. So from there on, I made about 15 experiments with different glaze bodies, and I really wanted to work with the uh, yellow to orange range, and I wanted to work with natural materials rather than stains. I found one that really worked for the level of warmth that I was looking for. I call it candlelight. And it's a combination of dolomite and spodamine and ball clay and silica with titanium and rutile thrown into the mix. All metamorphic minerals that are coming out of magma. And feldspar is one of the core components of the stoneware glaze, which is what I do. It's about 60% of the Earth's surface. Everything that you see that is sparkling is a piece of feldspar that is in this metamorphic rock. So this is a big bucket of candlelight glaze. And I usually stir it inside out and backwards so that the mineral particles and chemicals merge. You always do the inside liner of a glaze first. So I'm gonna pick that up, pour it in a couple of things. And now I'm going to slowly pour it out. It dries really quickly. 
I usually leave a little bit of a rim around the work because I want the glazes to mix where light and warmth meet. So I'll actually just paint this rim on just a bit lower. Okay, I do this quite quickly. I'm going to take it and drop it down into the glaze bucket and take it right to that top and lift it up. So now I'm going to put my lifeline in and I sometimes use a ruler but sometimes I just like the human touch and that's it and I go across and do the same thing on the other side. And I like to put a turquoise glaze on, which for me represents water. I'm going to be taking a little bit of my candlelight glaze and bringing it down into the lifeline. And I finish off with a little underglaze, a little orange. And you see it's going to fire out little differently than what it looks. It looks very subdued, but it should pop. This is a Chun Celadon glaze. The Chinese invented a Celadon, I think in the 14th century, to go over porcelain. It's a high gloss glaze that I think will be perfectly suitable for my sink. So my work has been glazed and is ready for the final stoneware firing. And the soft powder here will fuse together and melt in what is like the igneous process of the earth. And it, as it melts together, it changes. So the rutile becomes that beautiful, warm candlelight glaze I was after on the inside. We'll see that when we pull it from the kiln. And the outside lifeline of underglazes and stains will merge with the high white gloss and it will become a chemistry of color. The metamorphic process of the earth is actually in the clay body pot itself. And the clay actually melts completely and fuses together and becomes impermeable, which brings it full cycle back to stone, which is back to that metamorphic rock. So my kiln is like a mini volcano. What takes lava weeks to cool and harden on the surface, or hundreds if not millions of years to cool and harden under the surface, takes 17 hours in my kiln firing. Every potter works with time and temperature when they work with their kiln mode. What we do is we hold certain temperatures for certain amounts of time so that the liquid magma, you could say, on the outside of our pots have time to crystallize and flow in just the right way so that we can create the look that we want. And we experiment all the time. Mine is a 17-hour slow cool down from a stoneware cone 6 glaze clay body. This is the candlelight glow and it's glowing and the gloss white glaze that looked matte is now gloss with the underglazes and it's bled a little bit. It's dropped down and the rutile went from the gold to the light yellow to a little bit of an orange as it met and fell. So here she is. These are the female hills stacked and piled against the sky. They are sleeping. Poem by M.C. Richards. This is the textured outside, which is meant to resemble cliff faces and the pebbles, the rivers, the rocks, and the valleys. I have to get quite a lot in here before it'll start coming out. Recycling is important to me. I take the clay that I have used in this studio, all my trimmings and all the leftover clay, and I put it into cans and I rehydrate it, which turns it into a slurry. And I've poured out a plaster slab, which will 
basically dry the clay slurry. When I'm looking at this dried up slurry on my plaster table, I see the shaping of the surface of continents. I see tectonic plates. I see silt and clay up together on the top of a riverside. The one thing in common with all of it is the fluvial systems. They're based on water and movement. And so the Earth is alive, moving her body, giving it a stretch, causing volcanoes, causing earthquakes, and all that is just like a potter making her clay again and reusing it from a process of recycling. I'm going to move these ones first because that's where it's going to come out. I might be using a pug mill to churn my clay through and, and the vacuum pressure that it causes in the middle of that churning will suck the air out of it, just like the bottom of a clay bed, while the minerals are pouring through and creating a solid form that I can once again make new pots from. Here it comes, fresh recycled clay. I even recycle plastic bags that the original clay came in. I just wash them out and reuse them. For more pots. When I built my studio, the excavators dug up clay pieces that had clearly been primitive fired and made into sculptural pieces. And I have now planted them in my garden and they're slowly returning back to the earth. So here it is, dying into becoming how a potter recreates earth evolution as we embrace change and diversity and metamorphosis with the four elements of earth, air, water, fire, as we learn from the greatest teacher of all, our earth and our connection to her. Potter, this flat plate, this ladle and bowl, clay whirled on a wheel, raised slowly to the table. Straight and curved are primal gestures, take and give, speak out about the way we stand and breathe. Every leaf is saucer for the bread, every falling drop prepares its cup. Always we are eating and drinking Earth's body, making her dishes. Potters like sun and stars perform their art. Endowed with myth, they make the meal holy. M.C. Richards.